We're live again, episode three, uh, the Food for Thought live series. I'm so excited about this, and it just uh, makes me glow inside to know that so many of you are there, so many of you have watched uh, the first and the second interviews that we had with Good Heart Animal Sanctuaries and subsequently Luis Ahoyas, and they were incredibly well received, and you guys were so interactive and wonderful, for which I'm eternally grateful. And um, I'm going to aim to keep this going for, for quite some time. In fact, we, we've got guests lined up long into June. So um, there's going to be no shortage of people to, to introduce you to. And as you know, from what I've said in the previous two episodes, this is all about keeping the animal welfare and conservation community together, the environmental activists, keeping us all together, keeping us active, keeping us hopeful and positive and proactive in making a difference, even in these strange um, and restrictive times. And our aim is always to inspire and empower you to do just that. And all of my guests will be people who have inspired me. Um, and, and this evening's guest is absolutely no exception. Now, I know a lot of you know who's, who's, uh, who's going to be on already. Um, and a lot of you know him and love him as much as I do. And um, it's hard to introduce a guy who who you, the, the the list is so long in terms of all the things that I admire and that I'm grateful to him for. As you may have seen, if you did watch the, uh, or if you saw the, the, the promo photograph that I put out with the, with a number of things listed, I, I actually ran out of space in terms of what this, this man puts his heart into. Um, and so without further ado, I, because this really is a guy who, who is hard, it's quite difficult to introduce. Um, this guy, Mr. Peter Egan. Hi, Dan. How are you? Oh, so good. It's so good to see you. And you too. Thank you for that very kind introduction. It, it's very moving. Thank you. Uh, it, 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 it's really not kindness. It's absolutely justified and warranted. And, and I know that everybody, everybody, in fact, there's already dozens of comments from people who, who I, I know fully wholeheartedly agree with me. And uh, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, one of the things that immediately, aside from the fact that we've become friends through the animal conservation community and, and the various events and protests that we've, we've been at together and spoken at together and, and all that good stuff, I remember the first few times that I met you and heard you speak, um, you, you, um, you said something that stuck with me since, since the very first time you said it which is that you got up on stage at a, at a, a dog event. It was, a, it was a, a, a dog rescue that was holding a charity event. And you said, good evening, everybody. My name is Peter Egan. I've been an actor for 50 some years and an animal activist for 10. And I just wish it was the other way around. Yeah, that, absolutely true. Yeah. You know, the thing is that, um, beautiful. thank you. That's very kind. The, the thing that, um, thing that shocks me a lot um, is that I can't believe that I, went through so much of my life not being aware of the cruelty that um, we human animals impose on every other species on this our wonderful planet. And um, so I regret deeply my ignorance as far as that is concerned. And uh, it, it was when I became, I was very ambitious until I was 40. And uh, then at 40, uh, my wife Myra and uh, our daughter Rebecca persuaded me to get a dog or get a, us to have a dog. And um, I didn't quite get it even then. I loved having the dog and I, the dog was a dog, you know. Um, but after about nine years, um, it, we decided that to have more than one dog. And uh, someone said, well, you should rescue. Um, a dog did, in fact, collapse in front of my wife, uh, a lovely blonde Labrador called uh, Crackers. A custard, and um, that dog became our second dog. And then, sadly, we we lost custard some years later. And someone said, "Why don't you rescue a dog?" So we went to a rescue in Watford called the National Animal Welfare Trust. And I suddenly saw all these dogs in cages, and um, it was also it's multi species, and there were uh, pigs and uh, and cats and and all kinds of uh, creatures. And I thought, "Wow, what is all of this?" And, but even then, I didn't quite kind of lock into it. Um, and so uh, it, it was when I uh, rescued, uh, became involved with All Dogs Matter in North London, a, a wonderful uh, 
homing, rehoming charity run by Ira Moss. And I started um, sort of sort of rescuing quite a lot and, 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 and we built up our pack to about seven dogs at one point. And one of them was the most wonderful dog called DJ, who was a Border Collie Spaniel. And he, he, he was wonderful, certainly for me as an actor, because whenever I came home and I talked to him, this is about 20 years ago, he used to turn his head to one side and look at me. And, and he also he was listening to what I was saying. And I thought, oh, you're a wonderful creature. But he, he became my gatekeeper. And I looked at DJ and he sort of opened the door to me on all animals. And I thought, I've got to find out more because I had sort of lived in this world where animals were animals and humans were humans and sort of they were there for us. And um, so DJ led me down a path. Uh, and that, this is like about 20 years ago now um, that started opening door after door after door. And I then watched a film called Earthlings and that opened the biggest door uh, in, in my life, uh, the extraordinary cruelty in animal agriculture. And I thought, wow, I mean, how can I have lived all of my life not knowing that this was going on and that all of these happy cows in fields that, you know, are there because they want to feed us and they can't wait to get to the slaughterhouse. And, you know, so many of us believe that because we don't want to believe that um, in order for food certainly meat to come on our plate it, it, it involves huge cruelty yeah and um so I, I watched earthlings this is just over 10 years ago and um i remember I, my wife came into the kitchen after i'd finished watching it and she said i couldn't speak and she said what's the matter with you i said i've just watched the most devastating film it's changed my life and i will never ever eat meat again and i and i never have when was that say again when was that that would be just over 10 years ago. Um, and this is still, I'm still kind of learning late because DJ had been taking me down a path um, that I was kind of following him on in terms of just caring. But, you know, I hadn't joined all the dots up, you know. And at, at, at this time, I'm, I mean, I'm 74 this year. I was in my early 60s when, when this realization hit me and I felt so ashamed that I'd spent so much of my life not knowing and... And, and, and deep guilt about um, not caring enough to find out. And I think that's what has informed my life, particularly in the last 10 years. And, and that's why I do so much, why I follow so many charities, why I'm an ambassador for so many charities. Um, and the thing that it, it, it is the center of my life, which is um, compassion, empathy, and kindness and to understand that every other species on this, our wonderful planet, has a right to be there, contribute something magical, and they have a light, the right to live without fear and cruelty and without death. And um, so that uh, totally changed uh, who I was and what I was. And, um, and I determined that I would make up for the time that I feel I'd wasted by doing as much as I can <clears throat> before I kick the bucket um, to draw attention to the animal charities that I admire so much and to raise awareness. Um, because I do think people, you know, if you, if you said to someone, um, you know, buying a fur coat, you realize how cruel it is for you to have this fur coat, that some of these animals are skinned alive, that they live in cages. It is absolutely disgusting. So you will have to understand and make a contract with yourself that you accept that and say, I don't care. I don't care about that cruelty. I don't care that it costs an animal's life for me to have this little coat that I like and makes me feel good and all that kind of stuff. Same, similarly about you know what we eat. Mm. It's very important that everyone knows how meat arrives on the plate, that it is death arriving on their plate. And people constantly say, don't talk about it. I don't want to hear about it. And I think that's very unfair. I think it's unfair to themselves. I think it's unfair to the animal. Because the moment you do know how, what it costs an animal, which of course is their life, but also the, all the cruelty surrounding it, when you do 
understand that entirely, then you're making a huge decision to say, I don't care about that. I don't care the su about the suffering because I like it. And if you're going to be that facile, then um, I, I feel very sorry for you. And, and people do say, you have no right to tell me what to eat or you please don't tell me about all this kind of stuff that's upset, upsetting me. Well, you know, I, it's, um, it's more upsetting for all of the animals. So, um, sorry, I've waffled on a bit there, but that's the right. reason why I'm so completely focused and committed and determined to share as much of the horror as I can. Uh, please don't apologize. That's not waffling. This is incredibly powerful stuff. And listening to you talk, it just, I think is, again, it, it underlines why I say that I find you so inspiring. And I know that the the hundreds, literally hundreds of comments that have already come in, um, I would agree. Um, and, and I have to say to you, you know, just to go back, I can, I can relate to what you said about not even really recognizing the previous version of yourself from when you weren't vegan. Mm. Because my, I myself only went vegan three and a half years ago, and I'm, I was even speaking out for animals prior to having. In fact, I think when we first met, I was speaking uh, at Lion Aid events or something, and and I was yeah. still eating meat. I, you know, it's so the cognitive dissonance yeah. that we're all party to, and to some to whatever extent we call it guilt, guilty of. Um, I just, but I just want so where I can relate to you, I do want to just say that you exude all the things you've talked about the compassion the kindness the empathy you exude them you you as i said in my introduction to you on on the written version in in, in facebook you you shine your light and lead the way for the rest of us in that regard so where you talk about making up for your your previous years you more than do that well thank you i mean it i mean i do feel i have to say um extremely blessed and gifted to be given or to be aware or to release a passion in myself for something that I care about so profoundly late in my life is a gift. But, it, but more importantly, it is, it is so valuable because it is to do with not only our health as humans, it's to do with the health of our wonderful planet. And you know we are the only species on our planet that are colluding with our own destruction. And particularly during this period of time with this dreadful virus, people have got to take time to reflect and to understand that we are making, this is not something created by animals. This is something created by humans. And, you know, I've, I've been to the dog meat farmers in South Korea, and it was one of the most harrowing experiences of my life to see these beautiful creatures in cages um, raised off the ground, as you know, and under, uh, underneath the cage is their, their own effluence, which stinks to high heaven. And, um, and of course, the sound is horrible, and that affected me deeply. Then a few years later, I, I went with uh, a most wonderful woman, Lola Weber, who um, it runs the Dog Meat Free Indonesia campaign. And I went to Indonesia to visit one of these wet markets we're all talking about now, wildlife, as opposed mm. to wet markets, really, in Tomohon in Sulawesi, um, Indonesia. And um, it was extraordinary. I'm, uh, um, uh, we walked into this market, and at first you go into this wonderful world of vegetables and fruit and um, spices, and it smells magnificent. And it's very happy and active and alive. And... And I said to her, this is amazing. It's so easy to be a vegan here. Look at all this fresh food. It's fantastic. And she said, wait. And then five minutes later, we, there was a sign which said extreme market. And then we went into this market where it was just death wherever you looked. And living creatures being eviscerated, dogs being blowtorched, um, I mean, I don't know how I how I kept it together, and I watched poor Lola. I watched the color drain out of her face as she realized that, because we had been told there would be no dogs slaughtered in the market on the day that we were there, and she found four dogs underneath a tarpaulin that were terrified and in a state of shock, and she wanted to get those dogs rescued and saved from that market. And, um, and I just looked over and I said, what's the matter? And her face just, she, it, she was ashen. 
and we did everything we could to save the dogs, but sadly they were whisked away. Um, but what I couldn't believe was um, there were families and there were small children and they were all quite happily looking on as these live animals were being destroyed. And you walk through intestines on the floor. The smell is just shocking. There is meat covered in flies. So it is a, um, it is a breeding ground for all kinds of, of diseases. But it is the humans that are doing that, of course. Uh, of course. And um, so uh, now uh, with these coronaviruses, uh, I don't think it's karma, but it's not surprising that what is happening is coming back to infect us all. And But that's not just these wet markets. It happens in industrialized meat agriculture in the West. Of course. You know, and we think, you know, that, 80% of all antibiotics are bought by the meat industry in order to inject into the animals that are going to come into the food chain. And they are creating superbugs apart from the coronaviruses. So it's a major, major problem. And it is a time for every person on this planet to reflect on what they are putting onto their plates and what they're eating and what they're allowing to happen. That is apart from the appalling, appalling cruelty in wet markets and in industrialized food production in the West. And these are all reasons, I think, why I feel so inspired and proud to be a vegan. Because when I've had arguments with people in Southeast Asia or conversations about eating, I mean, I say to people, you know, could you eat your dog? If you, and they say, oh, no, I, you know, my, my dog is my companion. Or um, what I've said to someone in the extreme market in Indonesia, who was someone who had probably killed over 100,000 dogs during his lifetime as a market, market trader in dogs. I said, could you, could you eat your own dog? And he said, no, my, if I want to eat dog, I'll go to the dog meat restaurant. So there was cognitive dissonance again, even within that incredibly strange world of eating our companions and eating wildlife. Um, but we also have the similar problem if you have people in the West who are happy to eat lamb or, or pig or beef or dairy, um, you say to them, um, could you eat your dog? And they say, no, of course I couldn't eat my dog. And so what is the difference between your dog and um, and any other animal that's dying, because they do believe there is a difference in that, and they do believe that it's right because the animal wants to feed us, which of course it doesn't. Anyway, that that's, uh, is, is the center part of my life, and, I'm, and I am, uh, I'm inspired by the vegan movement. I'm inspired and stand on the shoulders of all those amazing vegans who were vegans when it was really hard, because at the time we are having a plant life, based lifestyle it's so much easier there's the, the variety is fantastic and it's amazingly exciting and we are inspired also by louis who was on the other night and game changes and all that stuff but alongside that i mean rather than dominating the conversation um with a plant style lifestyle which is um very very important to me i've met so many inspiring people um, like Jill Robinson, um, who founded um, Animals Asia. And Animals Asia is a fantastic charity based in China and Vietnam. And for people who don't know what they, what they do, they rescue bears from bio farms. And, you know, bears are magnificent creatures, as we know, and they can live for up to 30 years. And they live in a crush cage for 30 years, having the bile extracted from their gallbladder daily from an open port, which is, is a bit like having your teeth drilled without anesthetic. It's so painful. And living um, in a coffin. Say again? And, and living in a coffin. And living in a coffin, exactly. Um, and I was, Jill asked me if I would be a, an ambassador um, for Animals Asia, and I, I didn't know a huge amount about them either. 
And so I said, yes, I, 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 let me think about it. And I, and I decided to visit the, the sanctuary in, in Chengdu in the southwest of China. And that t changed my life entirely because mm. what Animals Asia do really defines the very meaning of animal welfare and animal rights. And I went to the sanctuary, there's 125 bears and no, 200, 200 bears and 125 acres. And um, it was just extraordinary. It was amazing. And to see, I watched an operation which took four and a half hours for a, a magnificent vet who was removing the gallbladder of this bear. I, I think in the photograph, you see me holding a bear's hand. If yeah. Yeah. That yeah. Was after the operation with this bear. And um, it took four and a half hours because the gallbladder had been attached to the liver. And so this this vet had to s s kind of slice it gently without cutting into one or the other and separating. It was the most extraordinary, caring piece of work. And um, I came came away having left my heart there, thinking this charity really defines everything I believe about animal welfare and animal mm -hmm. rights. Um, so uh, that is another gift that I have, being an ambassador for that charity. Um, and they have three sanctuaries, two in China and one in Vietnam. I'm hoping to visit Vietnam later this year when we're all out of this, um, this uh, lockdown. Um, I also went to, um, about six years ago, I went to Kabul um, to visit Penn Farthing's uh, shelter called Nauzad. Um, right, and um, so am I. Am, am I just wandering here in this conversation? No, 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 no. I'm just literally while you're talking, I'm pulling the uh, yeah. the Animals Asia yeah. uh, website up for people to see. Where you guys, if you aren't aware of Animals Asia already, please do go visit their website. As you can see right there, animalsasia.org, and you'll see some of the absolutely incredible work they do. And as Peter's just said, I mean, all, all animals need our help, but you you could argue quite justifiably that this is perhaps one of the most abject acts of cruelty that mankind inflicts upon an animal yeah. because it, it's it's sustained for years and years their entire the entire duration of their lives pain and and, and captivity beyond it's literally like a coffin sized cage so i th i thank you for bringing that up and and i i, and I, I know we do want to talk about now zad but i just wanted to ask you because i know you, we spoke we spoke recently about the fact that they've just recently rescued a number of other bears from Vietnam, and there's some news coming from Vietnam, isn't there? There's some. There is absolutely. There's there's a running uh, news. I, I think it's Const uh, Florence and Clara, Florence Nightingale and and Clara, another heroine nurse, um, and these two bears were were, were recently uh, rescued and are doing extremely well, having had a terrible life um, beforehand, and the week before, three other bears. And uh, isn't that beautiful, that bear there? In fact, my bear, Peter Bear, um, when he arrived at the sanctuary uh, just about nine years ago, he was in a crush cage in the fetal position, and they believe he had grown into that cage and had never, ever been allowed into a bigger cage. And he was six feet tall um, in a cage that I couldn't get half of my body into. Um, it's it's uh, just it's just unthinkable. It is, as you said, um, Dan. I think it's the biggest animal welfare issue in the world today because these bears literally live in these horrific conditions for thirty years, and that's just mind-boggling. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that there's still estimated to be somewhere in the region of sixteen thousand bears in that situation. There are, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, but however, is doing great, great work. I mean, they have uh, got bear bile banned in 30 provinces in China, um, and they're making huge progress in Vietnam. It's a very exciting things happening there. And uh, they also are sort of gaining hearts and minds. When Jill started the charity, I think in just over 20 years ago, there were no animal welfare organizations in China, and now there's over 100. 20, 150, and they've all been inspired by Animals Asia, which I think is just brilliant.
It's incredible. It really is incredible. I, I remember we were at an event together some time ago. I think it was the Moon and Back film. In fact, while while we're talking about about Jill and uh, and Animals Asia, the Moon and Back is an incredible film, which you I think you, you had a huge amount to do with in terms of carrying it through and narrating and interviewing. Absolutely. I interviewed Jill. It was it was a film directed by my very good friend Andrew Telling. It's in fact Jill's life story, mm. and you can see it online now. It's called To the Moon and Back. Orange Planet Pictures um, site, I think, has it. And it was ju it just tells you about Jill's extraordinary journey, and you meet some of the most amazing bears. And also, if pe anyone doesn't know about them or anyone's very interested, in, you can Google um, Moon Bear Fun, and you'll just see. Bears having the most wonderful time. Bears are extraordinary creatures. They are full of humor. They are very forgiving and they are quite stoical. They can put up with a huge amount and they're beautiful to watch. And and the the, the incredible work that that um that you and and Jill and Animals Asia do. It's. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, the, at the last count, they were up to 600 and some or 700 and some yeah, rescue yeah, bears. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Uh, it, it, just incredible numbers. And we had lovely. Um, I share my ambassadorship with my great friend Rick Wakeman, who is the wonderful keyboard player, and of course Leslie Nicole, who's Mrs. Patmore from Downton Abbey, who is they're both brilliant. So you know, it's just um, it's fantastic people to know, very inspiring people to know. It's. Uh, well, I, I'm going to I'm going to use this opportunity because, as you're, uh, as you quite rightly say, they're inspiring people to know, and uh, and just like yourself, Jill is someone who I know has inspired us both. Mm -hmm. um, and so, as well as saying that, I want you guys to find the um, to the moon and back film, which I think Giles, who's probably uh, online watching, will be sharing the link for this if he finds it in the comments section uh, so you guys will be able to click and watch that i can't recommend it highly enough because you'll you'll see exactly what pete is referring to in terms of the incredible work that jill does but i also want to take this opportunity to, to tell you that i'm incredibly proud and excited to uh, to announce that jill is also going to be one of our guests on this broadcast fantastic wonderful in a not too distant future so Great. we'll you'll be able to hear from jill directly uh, about all of these things too and i know how much it means to her to have you peter as her ambassador because you do incredible work for her and indeed everyone else that you support thanks that's great thank you so um you were about to start talking i mean because the thing as i said at the beginning we could literally this is a bit like the louis Hoyas thing yeah. we, could, we could probably go for two days and and fill that time constructively and people would still probably listen to you because of the the depth and significance of the things that you're talking about and and i know that you represent certainly more than i know I, there's the more more charities that i can count um that that i've when i was looking into how i would introduce you i thought well, I, I i can't i just can't but there's certainly more than 20. I got some of them. I have to just look them up myself when it was <laughs> um, oh, it's wonderful. I mean, it is beautiful, but I do know that, that, that this evening, the, the, and, and we had the great good fortune, both of us are patrons for the Good Heart Animal Sanctuary that, that were my first guests, and, yeah. and they, the incredible work they do, and a lot of which is very relevant to what you're talking about today in terms of factory farming and the link to pandemics and wet market so wonderful intake of sheep that have just come in um from is his, is his name Khan? Khan, yeah. yeah yeah fantastic story kumar. wonderful kumar that's it yeah kumar, yeah yeah, yeah um, beautiful beautiful that's absolutely worth a worth a look uh, on the good heart sanctuary website but i also i know that you want specifically and i think you just touched upon it briefly uh to talk about nowzad as yeah. well well, I think I think um, Pen Farthing, um, there he is. There, I mean, he's a remarkable. He's an ex-marine, and he did uh, a tour in um, Helmand Province, and uh, a lot of Marines, as people who follow it will know, um, uh, stray dogs. They had to kind of adopt them for a period of time, which gives them a sense of comfort and reality living in in a war zone, which is possibly one of the most distressing things that anyone can endure, mm -hmm. and. I just loved the idea of uh, a Marine, rather than leaving um, Afghanistan as quickly as possible, 
um, stayed there and started a shelter, which has become hugely, hugely successful and is doing great work there. And um, Penn invited me out in, I think it was 2013. And uh, on the day that we arrived, a mile away from us, um, 21 people were blown up. So it was a kind of, kind of pressurized uh, visit. And, wow. um, but I, I, and, I, and I'm, I was interviewing um, the person uh, who looks after the donkeys in his charity. And um, during the conversation, um, I watched it through afterwards when we filmed it, um, I could hear gunshots, which I didn't hear when I was doing the interview because I was so focused on on talking to this man. I didn't hear the gunshots going on around me. Um, but it, it was it, fantastic. And Penn has done amazing work there. And his team are fantastic. And he, again, is doing um, groundbreaking work, both for men and for women um, in a society that is um, very, very male dominated. And um, is is, change, is it changing hearts and minds again. He's, he's doing great work. So I admire him very much. Um, it's, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Because, we, uh, you know, you've talked about Jill and Animals Asia and, and, and we're talking about pen, farthing and and now that and in both cases for very different reasons but absolutely in both cases these are these pe people aren't just doing work that's incredibly emotionally and physically exhausting but they're doing it in circumstances that are perilous and incredibly challenging because as you've just described afghanistan and and a war, literally a war zone and in, and with jill in in the case of animals asia the the cultural requirements of of keeping in your place and and not not allowing people to lose face yes in that part of the world. they're working under extraordinarily difficult conditions in both cases aren't they absolutely absolutely i used to think of jill as someone with a toffee hammer tapping on a mountain of granite when she was doing her work and just slowly making cracks and getting in there and um she, she's incredible as indeed is pen but there are so many so many incredible people that, that are all suffering particularly at the, in this time um and i do think that i mean i would love it if um more people because we are we are still living with a victorian attitude mm. towards animals you know we we still have the sense of ownership we still believe that zoos are good ideas mm. um, you know, I think that animal welfare should be taught in all schools. I think that the children should be taught to understand that it's not right to keep a rabbit in a cage or a hamster or a bird in a cage. That if you really want to understand what an animal is like in its own habitat, mm. We have so much secret camera work. All the stuff that, um, that, that David Attenborough has done is so remarkable to really see animals in their, in, in their own uh, habitat and uh, having their own life. And that's how we should treat animals. Um, that we, should, that we should be at a distance so that we can see what they're really like without imposing ourselves on them or taking their space. Um, and as we know, and uh, this constant expansion of human territory invading animal territory mm. is continue this terrible situation where strange bugs are going to come out of the jungle and come and, and bite us and we've got to really learn to respect how important every other species is, is on our planet and we've got to stop savaging our planet and taking all the good out of it because it makes mm. corporations a lot of money uh, it, yeah and and again it's i mean you know this this is always a tough one isn't it because we know that the issues we have to address and and rectify in order for us to do that effectively we have to immerse ourselves in them as per your your discussion about the wet markets and going to the dog meat farm where you you, you know i i remember seeing you um when you put a put a view out from that and you were ashen you were you were broken and I and I sent you a message that you're of concern because of the fact that you it looked like it had really taken its toll on you and but but the thing is as you've pointed out and as so many of the, the kind comments have have also illustrated you know you have to we have to do that in order to to raise awareness and with that it's it's always so difficult to talk about these things because you're trying to find the balance between not hitting the barrier where someone's going to say I can't listen or watch anymore yeah. 
but also at the same time making absolutely certain that you are raising awareness of the issue and having it addressed. And with that in mind, and with what you've just said about the pandemic and the fact that we, you know, we're asking for trouble, we, we, you, you quite rightly said, you know, call it karma or call it uh, unsurprising. This was only a matter of time before this kind of thing happened. And it's only a matter of time before it happens again and probably in a far more damaging way. And now, to the horror of people like us, we d discussed earlier on that uh, chimpanzees are being subjected to tests for the vaccine and therapeutics for coronavirus. Yeah. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I mean, I, I think, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm not a scientist, so uh, I can't be absolutely sure, but I think time was wasted during the SARS epidemic, um, testing vaccines on, on chimpanzees. Um, it was a waste of time and held back finding um, a vaccine for that. Mm -hmm. And it, it, why, why don't scientists say, look, it didn't work last time, why do it now? I'm, I, I mean, I'm totally as any, any um, caring human being would be, I'm totally against all animal testing and animal modeling for human diseases. This is why I'm, a, um, a, again, an ambassador for, for Life on Earth, a, a great um, charity that, um, if I can just give it a plug um, in terms of what we're doing, that's that, there. It is there. Yeah, it's a it, it's um, a terrific um, science based charity, and we ha we currently have an early day motion EDM two hundred and fifty up, um, looking for all people to get their MPs to sign for a hearing um, judged by experts in their fields of science, so that we can really put animal experimentation to bed because. We, everyone who follows it knows that uh, it, it is a 90% plus failure rate and is holding back cures for humans. So um, I'll just give that a quick plug and ask people to get their MPs to uh, support EDM 250. Um, there it is right there. Uh, there it is, yeah. Yeah, that's what it, absolutely. Specifically, what would, is this, is this, um... In fact, here we go. Please ask your MP. So if you guys go to the web, web address, you can see at the bottom left of the screen right now, forlifeonearth.org, right there on the front page, you'll see in this blue box on the right uh, and below it, there's a link for you to ask your MP to sign early day motion 250. And that's what Peter's referring to. So please do that. Again, we've, we've talked about this from the beginning that of this, of this series of broadcasts is that we always want to be bringing you tangible calls to action things you can do to stay engaged to stay proactive to know that you're making a difference we, we're all in a very different situation living in a very different world right now and perhaps we haven't got the the finances to dip into our pocket and donate as you might ordinarily do this is something you can do which could be just as beneficial absolutely i mean i, I think also sharing information as you've just said dan is as important as, as donating as well it's so that people just get an understanding about what is going on getting an understanding how things don't work because we're to we're always smoke screened by well it, what about if it was your child or your mother or mm -hmm. your wife um who would you choose between them and an animal that we're experimenting on but what they don't say is that the experiment that we have we're doing on the animal it has a child a 90 percent plus chance of failure and so it's a total total waste of time absolutely um, absolutely and i think i th it may sound extreme i've said i've actually said this um not so, not terribly long ago on twitter and i'll say it now for the record um and i may be tempting fate but i st I, 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 st I really do mean this is that if a vaccine comes along if th therapeutics come along even if I find myself succumbing to um, to this uh, this virus that's doing the rounds right now, I would I, I will opt out. Thank you very much. I won't be taking any any vaccine or therapeutics that have been tested on animals. Same as every other product in my in my life. I'm not. I simply will not contribute to that. And if that costs me my life, I'd I'd actually feel more comfortable with that. Which might sound the dramatic. chances. Are, I mean it. The chances are that you won't have to make that choice because it won't happen because it's a total failure. Yeah, and also, um, there are so many things that I want to hit on here. Um, so uh, please I do. Know that, um, please do. Uh, if I can just um, 
this sense of dominion that we have over animals and they are there for our pleasure whether we wear them eat them or ride them or get them to do work for us i mean i think that people have to understand that an animal doesn't do anything for a human being without having its spirit broken unless it's a companion animal who comes to us like a dog or a cat i mean an example i'm going to talk about is um, elephants for instance and the use of elephants uh, elephants in um, entertainment um, and I am also uh, an ambassador for stay save the Asian elephant it's a, again a remarkable campaigning charity set up and founded by Duncan McNair who is a, a lawyer and a, quite a brilliant man and um, he has taught me about the terrible situation for the Asian elephant, its spirit being broken in a process called Pajan. And um, most people think that elephants quite enjoy sitting on their bottom and waving their trunk um, or doing paintings or riding on an elephant's back. They think it's a beast of burden. And so, you know, it probably isn't a problem to them. What they don't realize is that um, it that elephant will have been taken from its mother, its mother probably killed um, at a very young age, and it will have had its spirit literally beaten out of it, its spirit broken, it will have been starved, um, it will have been tied up in the most excruciatingly uncomfortable positions and prodded um, with um, those pointed, I forget the name of them now, those pointed uh, the bull hooks. Stick. The bullhook, that's it, um, and which is so painful around all the sensitive areas. And also, um, what has happened, uh, the incidence of TB have increased um, in our connection with elephants in uh, close proximity. Um, and ABTA, who uh, is the kind of governing body of uh, so many travel agents, for some reason, won't stop their members promoting um, events that are so cruel, um, that, uh, where the elephant, in order to arrive at the event, has been so badly treated. And again, you have um, tourists, and again, I would say to the tourists, if you know what you're going to, if you know how appalling the elephant's life is, um, to get it to the point where you're going to have a bit of fun uh, seeing it perform a few tricks, if you know that, then you are saying, I'm I actually don't care about cruelty. I condone this because, again, I want to have a bit of fun. Um, and But if you don't believe that, then pressurize again. Um, find out, uh, support STAE, S-T-A-E, Save the Asian Elephant, and support their campaign to get um, a hearing in Parliament again to change the law as far as advertising for elephant entertainment or any an animal entertainment um, is concerned, and and stop it. We can see elephants rescued and in sanctuaries and see them performing more naturally um, than seeing them beaten into submission and doing silly tricks for, for, for tourists. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I was actually just in uh, in conversation with, with someone about... Uh, an episode of, of abject cruelty towards an elephant in Sri Lanka and, and trying to get that rectified. Um, because, and it's, as you quite rightly say, Peter, it's not, it's not a case of this might ha be happening. It's a case of if an elephant allows you to ride on its back, that has happened. It's the only way that it will ever happen. Yeah. It's just not possible that without the animal's spirit being broken, um, they, I think they call them break boxes, don't they? They literally beat them for days and days on end until the elephant will do literally anything to avoid further beatings. Um, you can see in, in that photograph there of that elephant, it's like a zombie. It, look at its eyes. I mean, it's it, it, look at its trunk in, in that submissive position. I mean, it is heartbreaking. And that is the least of it, what you're seeing there. Absolutely. It's it's yeah. it's unthinkable cruelty, and I mean, as you quite rightly say, Peter, it's not it's not a case of you know bad people. It's a case of uneducated or ignorant or and blissfully ignorant sometimes. You know because people it can it's very easy 
to fall for it because it's all set all of the, the the horrors that we're talking about of course are behind closed doors they're all as as was the case at the wet market where you you found the dogs under the tarpaulin it's always hidden from public view yeah. and they know it has to be hidden because if most decent compassionate people with empathy did know what was happening they absolutely wouldn't they wouldn't need convincing not to do it they'd run a million miles away yeah. so please do absolutely. always and that's you know very well said peter you know just I couldn't agree more. We, we we have to we have to spread this word. That's again a very good point in terms of what people can do. What what actual tangible proactive action can you take? Well, you can share these things, even if you'll get the odd eyebrow raise or shrug from people. Share this information because as soon as the doors open and everyone's on planes back to Thailand, Vietnam, India, Sri Lanka, you name it. Elephant rides are happening, and they're happening in the, in the most twisted circumstances, like weddings, the happiest, theoretically happiest day of someone's life. Absolutely. And they, and they come on an, on the back of an elephant to make it look grand and, and, and exotic, and actually they have contributed directly to some of the most horrendous suffering that they would never have done if they'd known. I don't believe they would. Absolutely right. And also elephants standing in temples. They don't, they are given no water, and they are standing on concrete, um, it's just, I mean, elephants, you know, travel 40 miles a day in the jungle. You know, they're extraordinary creatures. Yeah. And the interaction that we've all seen with elephants. I remember seeing something a few years ago. Um, uh, 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 was it in the Sheldrick Foundation? I, I can't remember. Uh, where some an elephant carer had died. And a herd of elephants traveled for three days to come and pay tribute to this person. And mm -hmm. how did they know? Nobody knows how they knew, but they knew. It is they, they are extraordinary. Oh, we 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 just don't know enough about all creatures on this planet, and what they know themselves. And and what we do know, what we definitely know, is that they feel the same as we do. They love the same as we do. They create relationships the same as we do. The only thing they don't do that we do is we we rabbit a lot. We chat a lot, and um, maybe they talk in a different way. And. Uh, I just think I, I would like people to not turn away. I would like people to do what we do, Dan, which is to look at the material. I know that, you know, and I'm not, you know, saying, oh, what a wonderful person I am. I know that I'm never going to sleep peacefully for the rest of my life because every single day stuff is coming across my timeline that is the most shocking stuff you could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And one has to look at it because if you don't look at it and don't, you won't share it. And if you, if you don't look at it and absorb it, you, you won't have the passion that you need to carry on. And, um, you know, we can't have people saying, oh, don't do that to me. It upsets me too much because I'd say all the time, it's really much more upsetting for the poor animal, you know. And that's, yeah, we have to live, we have to, our lives have got to be defined by kindness and empathy. Well, you know, you said very early on that you feel like um, these things should be, you know, should be taught in in the school curriculum, and 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 it's a great question. Why aren't they? Because they are they they, they really. They, I can't think of anything that's more important. Imagine the world. Whenever we whenever we see an act of kindness, a, 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 something like that take place, where a life is saved, an act of selflessness, you always see the comments come in saying, "Imagine imagine a world where this was how it was." Yeah. And, and, it's, and the reason that comment's valid is because it would be an in, we'd, we'd be living in paradise. Absolutely, absolutely. So why yeah, well, yes. why isn't it taught in the, in the school curriculum? It's staggering that it's not. But I guess that's a that's a, a battle we'll have to fight on another day. It might be to do Dan with the, the division that we have in our society between animal welfare and animal rights. People are frightened of animal rights because they think it's people running around in balaclavas trying to blow other people up or, you know. Right. You can't have animal welfare just as you can't have human welfare without rights. You have to have animal rights as well. And you have to start from that point. And animal rights are, are in place because they control and condition people to accept that this animal is going to die, but we will give it a, a welfare to the point that it dies, um, which is, uh, you know, a nonsense, basically. Uh, uh, absolutely. Peter, I'm really fascinated to, to, uh, to know something, because it's certainly something I struggle with, and I know, and I'm sure, like me, you receive 
a, a huge number of messages from people who, who struggle with this same thing. And it's what you just spoke about. You know, you said you'll never sleep a decent night's sleep as long as you live because of the things you know, the things that you see. And we choose that. You know, we're not we're not yeah. looking for sympathy. We choose that. Um, I've, I've said many times, I, you know, I wouldn't, ch I wouldn't, ch I'd rather, you know, I've just, uh, people watching probably know I've just, I've just unfortunately lost a couple of orphaned mice that I was trying to look after. They were only in my life for 24 hours and I was devastated at their loss. But I'd rather feel that than be disconnected. Um, my question to you though, Peter, is, and it's a very personal question, but how, how do you handle that? Because I, I seriously struggle with it sometimes. How do you handle the things you see, the things you're involved in, and still having to get up and, and, and go do a job, not just any old job, but things like starring in Afterlife 2, which, by the way, congratulations, you were fantastic. What, how do you do it? Um, it, gets, it gets harder and harder, um, and I think that, we all suffer from compassion fatigue and at that point when you feel you can't see the wood for the trees you've got to try and pull back a bit and I, I, I try to do that and I will just watch rubbish or um, uh, just let, do something that kind of isn't forcing me to make judgments or think about it about things just you know a piece of um, uh, a western <laughs> You know, it's something, it's something that isn't demanding. So, uh, but what is strange is even then when I am trying to pull back, I feel I'm wasting time because when I'm not active, I just think of the poor creatures that are in pain who are every second of the day being tortured in one way or another. And I'm trying not to care, or I'm trying to pull back. And um, yeah. so uh, I'm kind of, I don't, I don't really have a, have a way of, of dealing with it other than my total belief in the absolute right of every creature on this planet to have the same rights that I have, and that is the right to life. Well, um much like the interview with Louis, you've kind of just given given me a statement that makes it almost impossible to um, to imagine saying something more powerful than that. I mean, that, what a beautiful sentiment to end on. Um, it, I I really can't thank you enough, Peter, because not just for being a guest on on the the broadcast, for for which of course I am very grateful, but for 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 being you, and for flying the flag and shining your light and doing all the work that you do and and for, for being so relatable with it, because I know, again, for me, absolutely this is true, and I know I know this is going to be true for so many people who are watching this, that to, to hear from you, and a, you're a pillar in this community of ours, and, and to hear that you feel these things, you know, to the, your, your, your willingness to, to open your heart and show the, you know, the, the, the fragility of it and the feelings that you have based on all these things that we're talking about, is inc I think incredibly powerful and empowering to myself and people who are listening. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for that. It's I thank you, Dan. That's very very generous, and and thank you for this time, Dan. It's been um, it, it's always very difficult to talk about it, isn't it? When, you know, and this one's talking about a specific campaign or a specific um, need. When one talks about it in general. It becomes it becomes like emotional spaghetti. You know, there's so much to care about and so many causes to support um, that you feel you're not doing enough um, by talking about one and not the other. So it's been yeah. great to have the opportunity to speak about a few that I care about deeply, and maybe you know later uh, next year I'll come back and do give you some more food for thought because it's been a great pleasure talking to you, Dan. Well, well, Peter, you know, it's uh, I, the only thing I disagree with there is the bit where you said next year. I was hoping maybe next week, or, or, or I, well, I really genuinely mean it. I think I think that absolutely, without question, it, it, there's so much for us to discuss. There's so much pertinent, relevant stuff to talk about, and and crucially important. So I absolutely would 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 love it if you would come back and talk to us some more because I know that very happy uh, to be listening happy and, to come back and just talk about a specific charity or a, let's a, do that. Let's yeah. do that. I, I know that um, 
I know that, we, that we will have a, a huge audience for exactly that. So we'll, I'm going to hold you to it. Um, Great. And just before we go, I'm going to uh, mention you'll have, you perhaps will have all seen on Facebook and uh, and shortly to follow on Twitter and Instagram, I'll be sharing the fact that my guest on Sunday evening, uh, I find this really wonderful because, you know, here's, here's Peter and I talking about the fact that we one of our regrets is that we got to the, the point in our lives that we got to before we made this gigantic realization that has literally become the core, the very center of our lives. Well, my guest on Sunday is a very young lady who puts us to shame in that regard, uh, Roxy the Zoologist, an absolutely incredible, inspirational young lady who has already and long since seen this, uh, the light that we're talking about and, and has dedicated her life to it. She's a, um, an activist, a climate activist, a wildlife photographer, a filmmaker. She's created her own eco-friendly company where you can find eco alternatives to mainstream products. She's about to make a film called One Step Beyond, which is about um, the uh, human wildlife conflict in Sumatra and the impact that that's having and the heroes that are putting their lives on the line on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, she's half my age. <laughs> and I mean, it's just, it, it, it's, it's an incredible thing. And it's what's so beautiful about it, as well as the fact that this person gives you such inspiration and is doing so much, is the hope that it gives you the hope that it gives you that someone of that age is going forward with those kind of projects because that's what matters most to her. Wow. I shall look forward to watching that then. I will, I'll be there. You Thank may you. hear in the background, you can, if you can hear some whinging, one of my dogs has come in and wants to go out. <laughs> Well, let's let's let that let's let that happen, uh, Peter. Once again, thank you so much. Please join me again on uh, along with Peter on on um, on Sunday at seven o'clock, where I'll be with uh, Roxy, the zoologist, as I say. Um, thank you all for watching, for your wonderful comments. As always, there are so many of them. I'm looking. There's 198 comments and questions. So I apologise for the fact that we won't be able to get, share your comments, uh, all of them, and your questions that you've undoubtedly asked. Um, but this doesn't happen without you guys uh, participating in, and engaging in it. So thank you so much for that. But most of all, Peter, again, you're, uh, you're a, a living legend in my eyes. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Take care. We'll speak soon, Dan. Yeah. Spread the love, everybody. Take care. Thanks, everyone, for listening as well. Thank you. Thank you, guys.